Okay, welcome to our kids' Bible study. If we'd open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13. We are just going through the stories in the Bible, and um, God gives us specific stories like this. They all literally happen, they all they're all true, but God tells us these particular stories because they're all here to teach us a lesson. And so we're just going through the stories here and learning what God wants to teach us in the Bible. So we're in 1 Samuel chapter 13. And last time we saw in chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 10 that God anointed Saul to be king. That Israel was again, God says, God says he would be their king. But they rebelled against God. They were serving other gods. They didn't want God to be their king. And so uh, God listened to them, gave them what they wanted, and gave them Saul to be their king. And Saul, we saw last time, is man's choice. If you lined up everybody in Israel, we found out last time um, that, Saul, uh, that Saul, in what was it, chapter 9, in 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 2, it says that Saul was a goodlier person um, than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. So he was taller. The tallest man compared to Saul came up to his shoulders right here. So from here up, Saul was taller than everybody else in the land. And that's usually what man does is when we pick somebody, we pick somebody who, is, who looks good on the outward. A lot of times the sports stars or celebrities, they're usually taller than, you know, the average person. They have physical looks that, you know, make them attractive to people. And that's the case with Saul. And so it wasn't God's choice. It was man's choice. And the thing with, when, with God, and this is why we believe that we've done some things that are wrong and that Jesus died to pay for our sin, is because if God judges us based on our own works, then we have to be perfect. We have to be holy like God. God told Israel, Be ye holy, for I am holy. If I want to make it into heaven without Jesus dying for my sins, if I want to do it on my own, then I have to be perfect. Never sin, never have a bad thought, never do anything wrong in my entire life. And of course, none of us do that. No matter how good we are, all of us are going to make mistakes. And that's what we're going to see today with Saul, is that Saul didn't believe in God, and he was trying to get eternal life through his own works. And so here we are in 1 Samuel and chapter 13, and there are these, there's this battle between Israel and the Philistines. In verse 5, 1 Samuel 13, verse 5, it says, And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Mishmash eastward from Beth-Avon. So it shows you there how Philistines were... God had told Israel when, God, when Abraham offered Isaac on the altar... When we were back there in Genesis, God told Israel, and I'll just read it to you. He told Abraham there regarding Israel in Genesis 22 and verse 17. God told Abraham that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. So you think about that sand that's by the ocean and all those little grains of sand. You know, how many grains of sand do you think are by that ocean? There, there are millions, billions. You, you can't even count them. You couldn't go out to the ocean and say, I'm going to count how many grains of sand are here. Uh, you'd, you'd die before you even counted them all. There's so many of those grains of sand. And God says, that's how I'm going to make uh, Israel, the nation of Israel, but because in the days of Saul here, because Israel doesn't believe God and they're trying to make it to heaven on their own, then you see here what we read in 1 Samuel 13 verse 5, that it's the Philistines who are as the sand which is on the seashore and multitude. You don't have Israel, Israel doesn't have nearly as many people 
as what, um, as what the Philistines do because they weren't believing God. They're trying to reach to heaven on their own merits. And so you can see in verse 7, 1 Samuel 13, 7, it says that some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. I mean, wouldn't you? If you're trying to win the battle on your own without God fighting for you, and you're fighting an army that has 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand of the seashore, so many people you can't even count them, and here you've just got a little army, uh, of course you're going to be scared, uh, and so that's what Israel is. They're scared. And so what they're doing is now what they're supposed to do is, remember, Samuel is the prophet. And so Samuel had told Saul, he says, uh, we're going to meet with the Lord, so wait here until I come. And once Samuel comes, then they're going to offer a sacrifice to the Lord and find out from the Lord uh, if they should battle these people and how God is going to give them the victory. So it says in verse 8 that Saul tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Samuel, for whatever reason, is late. Uh, he's supposed to, Samuel is the prophet of God, and so Saul is supposed to wait for Samuel to come. But he doesn't. In verse 9 it says, And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And so what he did was he disobeyed the Lord. The Lord had said, you wait for Samuel, because Samuel is the one who's going to speak for God. And once Samuel comes, we're going to have the sacrifice, and then we're going to find out from the Lord how we're going to defeat the Philistines. They're so numerous and, and so many people here. How are we going to defeat them? But Saul, he decides he's not going to obey God. He's going to offer this sacrifice himself. And so verse 11, it says, And Samuel said, What hast thou done? In other words, you disobey God. And you may think, well, that's not a big deal. I mean, it's not like Saul went out and robbed the bank or murdered a bunch of people. All he did was he offered a sacrifice to the Lord. But the problem is the Lord said, wait for Samuel. And he didn't wait. And that's the issue when it comes to us when we try to reach God on our own merits. There are all these religions out there. There's Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam and even Catholicisms and all these different religions, and they all have these different rules to try to reach God. And none of them are going to get life in heaven based upon their own works. Because somewhere, somewhere down the line, they're going to mess up. They're not going to do what God requires, and they're not going to be perfect. That's why we have to recognize that we're not perfect and trust that Jesus died for our sins. Saul, though, he's trying to be perfect, and here he offers a sacrifice before Samuel gets there. And so then the result is verse 13. 1 Samuel 13 and verse 13. It says, And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. This man who is going to replace Saul is David, and David is going to be God's king forever on the earth. When he is risen from the dead, when God sets his kingdom on earth, David is going to rule with him. And it's not that he's any better than Saul. We're going to get to David probably in a couple of weeks, and we'll see he does some bad things that he shouldn't have done either. But the problem, the difference between David and Saul is that Saul tried to reach God's kingdom based upon his own works. And so then God says, okay, if you're trying to earn your way into eternal life, you've got to be perfect. And so here Saul messes up. He offers a sacrifice to the Lord when he should have waited for Samuel. And since he didn't wait for Samuel, then God says, okay, you're not perfect, and so the kingdom is taken away from you. But with David, David, he makes mistakes too, far worse than this. But God says, I forgive David of his sins. He's going to be my king, 
And the reason he does that is because David recognizes that he has sinned and that he trusts in God to save him. And so that's the lesson that we learn from Saul and David is that the Lord isn't looking for us to follow a religion or to be perfect. He just wants us to recognize that we're not perfect and then we trust that Jesus died for our sins. And so then God gives us eternal life. And so you can see as we keep reading here, so you have uh, Saul doesn't trust God. He offers a sacrifice when he shouldn't have. And so now he's no longer God's king. But now you've got his son Jonathan in 1 Samuel 14. There's his son Jonathan. It says in verse 1, Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan the son of Saul said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. See, Jonathan believes God. And he knows that his father kingdoms take it away from him that Saul does not believe God. And so Jonathan says, well, the Lord said, remember Genesis 22, the Lord said, I'm going to make your people, I'm going to make Israel as numerous as a sand on the seashore. But right now it's the Philistines that are like that. So Jonathan says, I'm going to trust God that he will fulfill his promise in spite of the fact that my father Saul doesn't believe God and the kingdom is taken away from him. He's saying nothing is impossible for God, so even though it looks bad for us, I'm trusting God that he will deliver me. And so down in verse 6, he says, I'm going to see if God is going to win the victory. And so in 1 Samuel 14, verse 6, Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. In other words, we're going to go over there to those Philistines. Now remember... We read that the Philistines are as numerous as a sand on the seashore. They have 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen. And here is Jonathan and his armor bearer. So it's two people. Two people going to go over to where the Philistines are, where there are 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, all these different people. And he says there, it may be that the Lord will work for us. For there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And so he says in verse 8, Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men, and we will discover ourselves unto them. If they say thus unto us, Tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up unto them. But if they say thus, Come up unto us, then we will go up. For the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. So basically, Jonathan says, well, um, the Lord isn't talking to Israel right now because Saul isn't king anymore. And uh, he offered the sacrifice that he shouldn't have done. But I know that the Lord can save us, even though Philistines way outnumber us. He says, I'm going to go by myself with my armor bearer, and I'm going to see if the Lord will deliver us. And so he says, I'm going to ask, you know, basically find out from the Lord if this happens. And so you see in verse 11, both of them discovered themselves unto the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they have hid themselves. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me. For the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan, notice what it says here in verse 13. It says, And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet, and his armor bearer after him. And you think about it, the Philistines, they're so numerous. They're as the sand on the seashore. They got 30,000 chariots. They got 6,000 horsemen. And all you've got in Israel is two people, Jonathan and his armor bearer, and he's at a disadvantage because he's climbing up. You know, if I'm standing at the top of a hill and you're coming down to me, well, I've got the advantage over you because your, your climate says he climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet. He's had, it's such a steep hill, he's having to crawl up that hill. Now, how are you going to fight one person? How is one person going to fight thousands of people when that one person is climbing up on his hands and feet, 
and the Philistines are just standing there waiting for him. I mean, you would think, obviously, they're going to kill Jonathan. But you look and you see, it says in that verse 14, it's, or verse 13, it says, They fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within, as it were, a half acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow. So half acre, you understand that, you know, how much land that is. You know, it's probably, it's a little less than, you know, the property that you have there that you live on. And 20 men. And, and they're standing on the hill. Jonathan and Zara Bear are climbing on their hands and feet to try to get up there. And yet, one man, the armor bearer, and Jonathan, they're able to kill 20 men just in that little area. Because it shows, what that shows, it clearly shows that God has given them the victory. And the reason is because Jonathan trusts in the Lord. And so verse 15, There was trembling in the host, in the field, and among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers, they also trembled. And now you're going to see why they were able to do that. Is because God won the victory for them. Because it says, And the earth quaked. So it was a very great trembling. The reason that Jonathan and his armor bearer were able to win is because God won the victory for them. When they got up there, before the Philistines could slew, slay them, there was a great earthquake. And that messed up the Philistines where they couldn't destroy them. And so it shows God gave the victory. And that's the, we're out of time for today, but that's the lesson that we learn here is that we can't work our way to heaven no matter how hard we try because none of us are perfect. But when we trust in God, to, He'll give us the gift of eternal life when we trust that Jesus died for our sins. And so then God gives, that's the only way we could get to heaven because just like Israel here, we're powerless to overcome sin. We can't defeat it, but God defeated it through Jesus. And so then, we are considered perfect or holy because Jesus has saved us. Jesus was holy. And uh, you see that with God bringing the victory for Jonathan, for Israel through Jonathan, and God gives us the victory over sin and death through Jesus' death on a cross. Let's end with prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much that you sent your son to die for our sins. We trust in what he did for us rather than trying to work our way to heaven. Help us, Lord, to read our Bibles and to believe what you say in the Bible so that you, your love will come through us to others. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.